since it has been almost a week, a reminder that recursion is all about a way of solving a problem. It's almost like a mindset, a way to think about an algorithm where we use the solution to a simpler case of the same problem to solve a bigger problem. And there's a couple of requirements that we focused on last week. Um, one was is that the recursive method must actually finish at some point, which means there has to be a terminating case. An algorithm that never finishes isn't useful. Um, so a terminating case is the simplest problem to solve. With Martin and the Dragon, that was like the empty list. It was the empty loaf of bread. It was the factorial of zero, um, or zero factorial. Those were our terminating cases. Um, we did a, a string reversal, so our, our terminating case was the empty string. In addition, we also have to make sure that as we recurse, as we call the recursive method inside of other recursive methods, um, that those successive calls actually simplify the problem. If the problem isn't getting simpler, the recursive algorithm is never going to finish either, and that's not going to work. Um, so that means we remove one element from the list, or instead of doing five factorial, we solve for four factorial, or we cut a slice of bread off, um, or we try to reverse a string with one fewer character. Um, those are all examples there of, of simplifying the problem. Just as a reminder, we do not have to do things recursively. We never have to do things recursively. We can always solve them iteratively or mathematically. In fact, the recursive solution may be a little bit smaller, usually slower, usually we don't care. Um, the reason why we learn about recursion is there's a certain set of problems out there that when we approach them from a recursive perspective are easier to understand and easier to code. Um, that may be tough to believe until you get used to thinking about things recursively. But as you do get more and more comfortable with that, I think you're gonna appreciate that there are a set of problems out there where this is a very natural way to solve them. Reversing the string that we did on Thursday was not such an example, right? We would just write a for loop for that. Um, the pair programming activity that you're gonna do later today or start later today rather, um, not a good example of that, okay? But we're gonna do another problem together in a little bit uh, that I think is a good example of that, where it is much clearer what's going on when we look at it recursively. Um, and the second pair programming activity, the one that you may have time to start on Friday, I also think is a great example of that. Um, so hold on, be patient, um, and I think you'll appreciate how this works, or why it's useful, I guess, really. Um, I want to define two terms, and then we're going to run some code together so you can compare and contrast these two things. Um, the first is called tail recursion. Um, not every recursive algorithm falls into one of these two categories, but there are many that do, so they have special names. Tail recursion is when the recursive call, in this case, our recursive method is tail. Um, the recursive call is the call to tail inside the tail method that occurs at the end of the method. You can see there tail n minus one. This approach is similar to an iterative loop kind of style. Um, and in fact, the way this is written, we do, the, we do the problem solving part before we make the recursive call. So we print the value of n first, and then we call n tail with n minus one. So if we pass in a value of n for five, this is gonna print five and then make the recursive call. It's gonna print four and make a call. So eventually it's gonna print the numbers five, four, three, two, one. So that's called tail recursion, again, because the recursive call is at the end, the tail of the method. Another category is head recursion. Surprise, not surprisingly, the recursive call is at the head, it's at the beginning of the method. Not the very beginning, because we still need our terminating condition. We have to have that. So we still check here if, if n equals zero, that's our terminating condition. Um, but if it doesn't equal zero, we immediately call the recursive method. We pass in head n minus one. Only after that recursive call returns do we print the value of n. So this means we're not gonna print anything until we start unwinding that whole call stack of recursive methods. This is like when the dragon woke up from the dream, 
and added one to the number of slices of bread. Okay. So this will print the numbers in increasing order. Okay. It's going to print one, two, three, four, five, if n is five. Um, Let's take it. Let's take a look at an example like that in our BlueJ project. So, if you switch to BlueJ, there is a file called Head and Tail Recursion. It has a main method that makes the that um, calls tail recursion and passes the string Blizzard. It has a head method that also passes Blizzard, but to a recursive method called Head. And so before we run this, I want to can compare and contrast the tail and the head methods. Both have the same terminating condition, um, which is if the length of the string is zero, it just immediately returns. That's exactly the same. And there's only two other lines of code in these recursive methods. Um, one line of code is to print the character at index zero. So it prints the first character in the string. Um, and then the second line of code is either the recursive call to tail or the recursive call to head with a simpler problem. And the simpler problem is the rest of the string. So we just do substring with an index of one, which starts at index one and goes through the rest of the string. Piece of cake. Um, the only difference between these two methods is whether it's head recursion or tail recursion, the order of the call. So up here in tail recursion, we first print the character and then we do the tail recursion. Whereas with head recursion, we make the recursive call first and then we print the character. Okay. And simply by switching these two lines, we get two very different behaviors. So let me actually run this. You are certainly welcome to run it as well. So with tail recursion, it prints the string blizzard um, in order, right? Like the, the, the characters are in the order as expected because in head recursion here, we first print the first character. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, in tail recursion, I got that backwards. We first print the character and then we call the recursive method. Whereas with head recursion, we call the recursive method first and only print when we're unwinding the call stack. Meaning with blizzard, we're going to actually call head recursion for the string lizard and call this method again. And then if we trace through, we're gonna call the string uh, lizard is gonna become izzard and we're gonna call it again. And now it's zard with two Zs and then it's zard with one Z and then it's ard and then it's rd and eventually it's d and eventually then that string is zero. And only as we start returning due to this return statement, do we actually start printing out the characters? So the first character we print will be the D and then the R and then the A. And so it prints out the string backwards. So I, I like this as, you know, the code is basically identical except the order of when we call the recursive call and when we print and we can see it results in several different behaviors. So I want you to be familiar with the terms head and tail recursion. More importantly, I want you to just appreciate that when you do, when you make the recursive call has a profound effect on the algorithm, right? These are two totally different algorithms with almost identical code. So that's the key takeaway from this head and tail recursion part. There's another example I wanna show you and I want us to like change this code. This is, I think, my first attempt to convince you that there's something useful about this recursion thing. So there's another file here I want you to open up, which is called palindrome tester. Yeah, question, yeah. Sure, oh, great question. Yeah, absolutely. So return means just return with a semicolon, means stop running this method right now and return. Um, and because there's no value after the return statement, that's appropriate because this method has a void return type. This is kind of a special example of recursion because uh, I wanted to keep it really simple. Most of our recursive methods have a non-void return type. And so we'd actually be returning something from the method, but we can certainly do this as well. The other class I want you to look at is called palindrome tester. 
this code is from this code is like a starter code from an extension from last semester so you may have not seen it um but just to set the stage a little bit a palindrome is a word that um, has a sequence of characters that are the same forward and backwards okay that's our definition of of a palindrome um which is kind of it's fun it's a fun thing um it's a cool word too so this code checks if the entered string is in fact a palindrome and so we've got these variables left and right and they're initialized to these values we have this while loop where we're checking characters and the comparing left and right we're incrementing left we're decrementing right we're checking if left is less than right and based on that we determine if the string is a palindrome or not um, this code works it's great um, I would argue it, especially if I left out the words palindrome and I just gave you like this here, I think it'd be tough to figure out what this algorithm does, right? It's not very clear. And so starting from what I consider a not very clear algorithm, one that's hard to read and understand, I want to replace it. I want to refactor it with a recursive algorithm which I think is much more intuitive when we look at it. It may be still a little bit hard to understand because we're still wrapping our head around this concept of recursion. Um, but as we get more and more comfortable with it, I think we'll appreciate this approach more and more. And so what I wanna do um, is we're gonna delete some of this code and replace it with something easier. So we're gonna leave, there's a do while loop here so we can try multiple palindromes, that's fine. We're gonna leave the print and the scanner, that's fine. But let's start at left equals zero and delete everything through printing whether it is or is not a palindrome. And let's just delete all of that. And we're gonna replace it with just another method call, which will be our recursive method, okay? So our, our potential palindrome is referenced by this variable str. So we're gonna say if is palindrome, that's the new method we're about to write, and we'll pass along str as the string. And this method returns a Boolean. So basically we're saying if is palindrome returns true, well, then we're gonna print out that it's a palindrome. So system.out.println. That string is a palindrome. Else, I'm gonna copy and paste that. If is palindrome returns false, we know it is not a palindrome. And then we'll ask if they want another one, okay? Yes, this is simpler just because we did method decomposition. That's not the point of recursion. Um, this, in order to make this recursive, we need some method that is in fact recursive. So the actual new method is palindrome is where we're gonna do the real work, so. So let's write the method. It will be public, it will be static because we're not creating an actual object here. It's gonna return a Boolean value. It's called is palindrome, and it takes one parameter of type string. And I'll use the parameter name str. We have certain requirements when we write a recursive method. The first one that I always tackle, because if I forget it, nothing's gonna work, is the terminating case. So what is, what is an easy string to determine if it's a, that we know would be a palindrome? Easy string. Empty string, that'd be pretty easy. An empty string is a palindrome. What other string would also be easy to tell whether it's a palindrome? A one character string. A one character string is also a palindrome. 
A two character string? Yeah, not necessarily. We'd have to look into that. But we know that a zero character, an empty string, and a one character string are both palindromes. So that can be our terminating case. So we're going to put a comment here just because we don't want to forget. Must have a terminating case. Super important. And our terminating case is going to be if the length of the string is less than or equal to one, we're simply going to return true. It's a palindrome. Now, in this recursive method that we're, we're writing, we're only looking for an answer like true or false, right? So we're just going to be returning trues and falses. In other recursive methods, we're looking for something more, like we're looking for, um, uh, like, what's the value of five factorial, like with Martin and the dragon, right? Or we're looking for how many slices are in the loaf of bread, or we're looking for a string that has been reversed, or in the pair programming activity that you'll start in a moment, um, we're looking for a, a new array list, okay? Um, but in this case, we're just looking for a Boolean, much like, hey, are all the numbers in the list odd? Um, or even, I forget what Martin was looking for. All right, so we handled our terminating case. So now we will solve a small part of the problem. Imagine you had a very long string, hundreds of characters. And I asked you, is this a palindrome? But approach it from the perspective of a lazy dragon. You're not going to look at 100 characters. You don't have time for that. But you could take one small step towards a solution, right? If you were the dragon, you would tell Martin, I'm not going to tell you whether the string is a palindrome, but I'll tell you whether the first character is equal to the last character. And in fact, if you, you actually had a printed out string in front of you and I asked you if it was a palindrome and it was 100 characters long, that's what you would start with, right? You'd look at the very first character. You look at the very last character. If they're not equal, you know it's not a palindrome and you're done. If they are equal, you could erase that first character, you could erase that last character, and you could give that sheet of paper to your partner and say, I'm done, your turn. Is this string a palindrome? And let them work on it, right? So that's the approach we're gonna take. Our small step towards the problem is to look at the first character. So I'm gonna do the substring method on the string, starting at index zero, which is inclusive, and going up to index one, which is exclusive, that gets the first character. I'm also gonna get the last character. How do we get the last character of the string? Well, we get the length of the string minus one because a string with 10 characters that has a length of 10, the valid indices are from zero inclusive to nine inclusive. So if we want that last character, we have to do length minus one. I left out the second parameter because by default, it will just get the rest of the string, which is only that one character. And then we'll like ask a simple question. If the first character equals the last character, and notice I'm using the dot equals method because we're interested in it, we're interested, in, are these two characters the same characters, not do these two variables reference the same object, right? So we're, we're have to use the equals method. If they are equal, well, it might be a palindrome, but we're done. Someone else can solve the rest of it. So we will recurse with a simpler, sim simpler, simpler version of the problem. What's the simpler problem? Well, we'll simply return whatever is palindrome returns, true or false, for the rest of the string. And the rest of the string is the substring starting at index one inclusive and going up to, but not including the index of string length minus one. Else, well, if the first and last character are not equal, just return false. We know it's not a palindrome. We don't even need to look at the rest of it. So I would argue if I were to give you this chunk of code, especially once you have more practice with recursion, 
you would have a much easier time determining what this algorithm does than the code we started from. And I think that's because a palindrome, determining if a string is a palindrome is naturally recursive. I think it's naturally recursive because if I were to give you again, that string on a piece of paper with hundreds of characters, you would solve it in the same approach as the code we wrote. You'd like use your fingers and you'd look at the first and the last and you'd do simpler problems. Um, and so I think this is a good fit. Um, I think the benefit here of recursion is that this code is more readable and therefore it's more maintainable um, and we're less likely to have, have bugs. So do compile and run this. Try your favorite palindromes. If you don't have a favorite palindrome, don't worry. There's still time to, to have one. Um, some of my favorite palindrome, my favorite palindrome is Taco Cat. Taco Cat is a palindrome. I think it'd be a great name for like a food truck. They might have to clarify that the cats aren't in the tacos, but I still think it'd be a great name for a food truck. Um, another fun palindrome is race car. Um, a longer palindrome is a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. That's a palindrome. Our program doesn't deal with spaces and punctuation. That was actually the extension last semester. Um, inside of the folder that holds all of this code for this current unit, there is a text file, um, actually a couple text files. One is a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. This won't work unless we add the extension support to deal with punctuation. But there's also this poem. This poem, this whole poem, is a palindrome. I think that is so cool. Um, again, we have to add the extension to deal with spaces and punctuation, but here's an entire palindrome poem. So some cool examples, cool examples there. Um, that said, if I instead type um, like computer, oops, <laughs> I didn't answer the question. If I run this again and type computer, that is not a palindrome. So our code works. This is it. This is all good. All right. So the pair programming activity that we're going to start now in just a moment, and you'll get about 15 minutes to work on it, which is great. Um, I want to give you a little time to get started with your pair programming partner um, because you're with someone new. Um, you two might have questions and I want to be able to ask ask those. I want to be able to answer those before the end of class. Um, this is a very structured pair programming activity. The first section is an introduction. Please don't skip it. Please read through it and discuss it together. Um, the first thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be writing a recursive method that creates an array list of integer objects, one, two, three, four, up to the specified value n. If we really, if we wanted to do this, would we actually do this recursively? No, you'd write a for loop just like you did like the last two units. Um, but we're going to do it recursively for practice. Okay, we're going to work our way up to more authentic examples. Um, so no while loops allowed, no for loops allowed. Remember, you are the dragon. Be lazy. For loops, while loops. That takes a lot of effort. You're not going to do that, right? You wanna do one small step toward a solution. And so this lab leads you through the terminating condition. It talks you through some of the small step stuff. This is a more sophisticated recursive algorithm than what we've written together because it's not just printing something. It's not just returning true or false, it's returning a new array list. If, if you don't, store or do something with the value returned by the recursive method, you're doing recursion wrong in some way, most likely, right? Even in the simple example of the palindrome code we were looking at, we still did something with whatever the is palindrome call re returned, right? We might've just returned it, that's fine, but we didn't ignore it, right? If you're making a recursive call like this and you're not doing something, you're not assigning that return value to a variable, um, probably missing the recursion and it's not going to work. In this case, you definitely have to do something with that return value. Um, so this will lead you through that. 
Um, and then you're going to write another recursive method that reverses the list, meaning it takes all the elements in the array list and it reverses their order. Um, that will require making a copy of the list. Um, and it talks you through how to do that. And then you can write the reverse list. And then there's some extensions here as well. Historically, pairs have struggled to get this working. Okay. So unfortunately, I won't be here tomorrow to like help you out with that. But I have the next best thing. A couple of years ago, we got to this activity um, right when COVID first hit and everything was shut down and we had to go home and everything was like asynchronous. And so it was kind of challenging to work through this, this pair programming activity, which was more of a solo pair programming activity. Um, so what I did is, and what I usually do in person is we role play the recursion, right? So we go back and forth and I ask you to take a small step towards the solution. And then you give it to me and I solve the rest of the problem. And then I give you that answer back and you incorporate it into the final, the final answer. But online, we couldn't role play. And tomorrow, we're not going to be able to role play since I won't be here. So what I've done is I went back and I found the video from a couple years ago where I role played it with my cat. Okay. So my cat and I did the recursion. And I took a small step towards the solution. And then I gave it to Max. And Max solved the rest of the problem. Um, so I will link to that video tomorrow. So if you and your pair get stuck, um, or if you just want to see the silly video, um, I think that's going to help you make progress on this activity. All right. Um, so you'll have a little bit of time today to work on it. You'll certainly have mo like half a class tomorrow. You also have Friday. Some of you are going to be done Thursday for sure, uh, tomorrow for sure. The next pair programming activity, um, which will be in our daily agenda, just like everything else while I'm gone, will be right down here. It's called Mountain Valleys. It's a much more authentic activity. I am giving you topographic data and code that draws it on the screen. You are writing the recursive method to simulate rainfall. If rain falls evenly over this topography, where will the water run off? Where are the rivers going to form? Where is the water going to pool and make lakes? Okay. This is like actual important, like environmental engineering stuff that you're going to write and simulate with recursive functions, which is super cool. So if you have time, you'll start that Thursday or Friday. Um, but don't worry, we're certainly going to be working on that next week as well. All right, so now you've only got like 10 minutes. Um, read it over with your partner. I'll interrupt with like two minutes to go to see what questions you have. And then we'll be in great shape. <laughs>